Annie, what do you? Annie is Annie is talking with us from uh, on the basis of YCS, right? Jeff, are you there? I don't think he's online. Jeff's not there. Okay, so here you go. You ready? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so Senator Irwin couldn't be here. At least I don't think he's here online. Um, but I just wanted to take some time to both congratulate the whole Washtenaw delegation and him for working on eliminating the remaining debt from the Willow Run and Ipsy public schools merger. Um, so that happened a decade ago, and it was during an era of the Snyder administration where they were trying to force schools like Ipsy on um, the other schools that debt got eliminated from um, this week were Inkster, Benton Harbor and Pontiac, Muskegon Heights and Pontiac. And the um, common factor in all of those schools is that they're predominantly black um, and they were under um, invested in for a long time. And then back in 2012, there was this big push to get schools to consolidate. And in Ipsy situation, um, it left the new school district with a lot of debt. They were paying $2 million per year out of their operating budget to pay off the remaining debt from the merger. And um, that really limited their ability to pay you know, their teachers better and invest in student achievement. So the total amount that Ipsy schools got, and I'll say they got more than any other school this week, $42 million, um, 19 of that Um, 19 of that was from the loans that they had to keep taking out. The The remaining operating was a little bit lower, around $5 million. And then the rest of the money, um, it's about $18 million if I'm doing the math correctly, that will be able to be reinvested into the school district for what we just kind of broadly said, student achievement. So I know that they have some plans for how they want to invest back into YCS. Um, and we couldn't have done it without the Washtenaw delegation, Rep uh, Brabeck and Rep Morgan and Rep Wilson, who couldn't be here. Um, and Senator Irwin and, and really the whole Washtenaw delegation, um, even the the folks that don't cover Ipsy at all, they really fought really hard to make that happen. So I just think it's a it's a moment for everybody to celebrate in Washtenaw County, but it's going to make a lot a lasting change for Ipsy. Thank you, Annie. Annie is um, the chief of staff for Senator Jeff Irwin and also a member of the County Board of Commissioners. I want to do I want to stay with the legislature. OK, and then we'll. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm thinking, too. So who wants to be first up? Felicia Brabeck, state rep. Thank you for being here on Saturday morning. <laughs> Happy to be here, here with my amazing colleague, Jason Morgan. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> uh, Good morning to folks online. Uh, we've had some long nights uh, this week uh, in Lansing. I think we both have gotten home uh, two nights around two thirty in the morning. Uh, so, uh, but we are excited for the good work uh, that we've done. Annie just talked about the forty-two million that we were able to get for uh, Ipsy, which is incredible uh, and so exciting, and so grateful to Senator Irwin and Rep Wilson uh, for leading on that. Uh, but there are super exciting things that have been done uh, as well. Uh, we uh, voted on the Reproductive Health Act this week. So shoring up those rights for folks, uh, and that was very exciting. Uh, the other big packages that we voted on uh, were our, I'm not going to get the, there are very fancy names. Um, yeah, I'm, the, the yeah, yeah, so yes, <laughs> so, exactly. So the energy and climate package and the solar siting package. Uh, so we voted on those uh, as well. Uh, and so that really, um, uh, characterizes and um, sets our energy goals for the state uh, for the upcoming decades uh, so that we can uh, add to making our planet more sustainable, uh, which we are very excited about. Uh, and Jason will have some other news uh, in that that world as well. Uh, a couple of things that I'm working with colleagues on, two major things to try to uh, get past it or move along, one to hopefully leave the house in the next couple of weeks is a major mental health care piece. Uh, it would, the bill focuses on um, ensuring that private insurance companies uh, use national clinical standards when they're either approving or denying mental health and substance use and abuse care. Right now they use their own proprietary criteria and uh, lots of, um, Hedy and I were just talking about this as psychologists, we have lots of clients we know who get denied services to care 
uh, and then there are implications for that later. So really trying to focus on getting folks the care that they need when they need it. Uh, so that's the first one. The second one, uh, and lots of folks here, uh, former county commissioners will remember this, uh, well, and one current county commissioner, um, were, I'm hoping to get the plastic bag ban, the ban, the ban, out of committee this week. Uh, so we're moving along with that, have been working with Senator Schink on that, on the Senate side, um, but we're getting some traction on the House side. So those are a couple of the major things, uh, but the know that delegation is working incredibly hard. Uh, sleepless nights, uh, someone sent me a picture of me on the floor like this the other night. <laughs> but we love being there for you uh, and always never hesitate. Uh, please never hesitate to reach out. Thanks, Felicia. Uh, and yeah, so if we seem uh, like we are a little less energetic today, it's been a long week. But I am uh, the most excited when we have weeks like this week where we're getting things done. That's huge. I get very grumpy on the weeks when we're there all week and we're not actually doing much. Uh, I get very grumpy when we do that. But this week was so exciting. And Felicia mentioning the climate and energy package, uh, that moves us to one of the most robust uh, climate and energy policies in the entire country. This is a huge package. We will be uh, up in the top five nationally for our uh, climate policies. So this is huge. It has taken many months to get to this point, and it was very, very difficult to get through. Let me be clear. It's not perfect. There's still a lot of stuff in there that we would like to improve, but uh, this is a massive win. Uh, and so that's that's just so amazing. I'm so excited. Uh, this is one of the things that I felt like after the spring, I felt like we really, really had to make a huge push in climate and energy. And a lot of folks were were saying that we're going to do it. We were saying we're going to do it. But uh, to be honest, I wasn't sure if we were really going to get it done. And we did. So I'm thrilled. Uh, so that's huge. Uh the other piece I'm really excited about, we brought, uh, we had a supplemental funding bill this week. And so we brought a lot of money back to Washington County that we have very much needed. Uh, in addition to uh, Ipsy school debt, was, which is huge, the 42 million there. Uh, we got $5 million for Washington Community College, uh, $5 million for University of Michigan. Uh, wait, what's that? Yeah, 30 million. Yeah, so I wasn't done yet. Yeah, so 30 million for EMU. Uh, and then we have additional money that will come to WCC and U of M through uh, uh, funding for something called the item program. Um, so, yes, a million dollars, the uh, Ann Arbor Election Center. So we just we won really, really big for Washington County this week. Uh, so it's been great. So thank you all. Mm -hmm. Uh, the last thing I will say is we um, next week we we have to pass uh, implementation of Prop One. Uh, so I'm I know a lot of folks in this room worked really hard on Prop One, the financial disclosure for legislators, uh, and that work is not done. I will tell you the the Senate passed bills to to implement the the basics of Prop One and and a little bit extra, but um, I firmly believe that we have to include spousal reporting in Prop One. Uh, if we're going to make it actually re like real financial disclosure, Felicia uh, and I have talked a lot about this and we agree, uh, we have to make sure our spouses are included. As somebody who just got married, I am totally okay including my spouse in this. He's okay as well with that. Uh, we have to. It's a glaring loophole that will not move us very, very much forward on financial disclosure and ethics for our legislators. And so I'm telling you this now because it has been a uh, rather contentious issue this past week. And I've been working with a number of legislators and putting myself out there to say, we have to have this. I don't want something that's just pretend disclosure. Uh, and I say that now because uh, it gets me in trouble in Lansing. And I know when I come home here, I'm always going to have folks who have my back on these things. Um, but uh, it is the sort of the next big effort this next week. So hopefully we can get that done and we pass a really good financial disclosure bill. Um, but just so many exciting things. And it's so great to t share these with you all. Isn't this so great when we elect Democrats? <laughs> This is all your work. So your work. <laughs> thank your you, work. you guys, everybody. Um, and we we also, well, you want, De Debbie, do you need to do, you need to talk? I mean, do you, how's your time? 
<laughs> but we need you to talk. <laughs> so it feels a little discordant, right? Because like we've got our be beautiful blue state and, and our people are working so, so hard for us all the time, staying up until 2.30 in the morning. And that includes the County Board of Commissioners, which I don't get. But I mean, they spend so much time. But, you know, so we have this beautiful, hardworking, democratic state right now and our local government. And it's so wonderful to see all the hard work and the progressive and kind and compassionate work that's being done to help people. And then our wonderful, beloved Congresswoman Debbie Dingell is facing something completely different in the U.S. House of Representatives. So please come and Fill us in and then we'll end up with a happy, we'll go back to the county board of commissioners and some really constructive work. Thank you, Teresa. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I wish I could tell you I was in a great mood, but I'm not. Um, Washington has been an interesting place uh, for the last month. First of all, let me do, like go to something good first, because I need to feel good up and yelled at until three in the morning and I've phone started yelling at me at 6 a.m. But we did get news yesterday. Uh, well, it was the, we got news this week that, you know, we've all been working on the plume for decades. And uh, the many of the elected officials in this room, Jason was critical to, did Jason already leave? Oh, you're right there. Jason and Fleet were critical to helping us bring all of the communities together instead of Gelman's keep them divided and we will conquer and uh, made as in open forum meetings with everybody there agreed to try to proceed. How many years did you hear that if you went for a federal Superfund designation, you'd never get it. They won't give it to you, won't qualify. It'll take decades. Well, it was about two years ago that everybody said, let's move forward. The governor said, if that's what the local communities want, then I'm going to support it. And yesterday, EPA posted officially on their website that I mean, this I mean, it's sad in a way too. But that and they did a third round of testing because we know that Gelman will try to sue, and they wanted to make sure they were ironclad on the data that Gelman will not be able to dispute it uh, in court. That they posted it on their website that this is eligible for what's called the national priority list. Um, and uh, if things go as they should, uh, there'll be a federal register listing. They do this in a process, a proposed rulemaking, putting the plume on the national priorities list, which would make it a super fun site. It will be finalized in the spring. Uh, government's going to sue, but they're not going to win. And, it, once this is designated officially, the EPA will take over the site, they will put money into it, and the federal government and EPA have polluter pays ab yeah. ability. So they will have the ability to make the polluter pay. Yes, they, bottom line, that's what it's, Jason, we're gonna, we're gonna, we got a plan to get this cleaned up. So it's gonna take time, but you know what? If this had happened 20 years ago, think about where you had been. So and everybody, every time I had a meeting, people would say it'll take too long. Well, we're on the way. And it didn't take 10 years like everybody said it would. It took two years and it's still going to take time, but it took 45 years to get here. So we got a plan. So that's the good news for the county. Um, and they'll talk about other stuff. But um, look, I'm not going to tell you Washington's a great place right now. Uh, we did, since I've last talked to you all, get a speaker. Uh, I do know him, and I'm, I've am i even done bills with him. Um, he is civil and respectful, unlike some other candidates, but he is very conservative. The way this week um, we were starting to do the appropriations bills, the way that he handled funding for some very serious issues in uh the world like Ukraine and Israel and humanitarian aid was not helpful. It sent a, a signal. Uh, I'll talk about the Mideast here in a minute, but he 
cut out humanitarian aid and cut out humanitarian aid to which the president and only wanted money for war in for to give money to support to Israel for defense. And the president opposed the bill. He said he would veto it. Uh, Democratic leadership asked for a no vote. And it's hard because it, I'll go to this in a minute, but it's not hopeful for the way that, I mean, Mitch McConnell has said we need to continue to support Ukraine. We need to support humanitarian aid in Gaza. What's happening there is a nightmare. Um, so I'll talk about that in a minute. So um, it is not to be interpreted uh, as not supporting Israel and the need for its existence, but it's the way that he framed it. And the budget expires again. Uh, the continuing resolution goes until two weeks yesterday. No idea if I'll be home for Thanksgiving. Uh, I, I th we believe that he does not want to shut the government down, but there's no real work happening to keep the government opening. And it's just a really serious time. I've never seen the Congress struggle or be as divided as it is now. You've got a United States Senator Tuberville who is blocking the nomination and com or the confirmation of top military appointments for months because of abortion issues and choice. The commander general, acting commander general of the Marines had a heart attack and we have nobody leading the Marines and the world is more on fire than it's been in decades. So there's some reasons to get frustrated, but um, for me, one of the hardest things right now is what is happening in the Mideast. I've talked to many of you about it uh, this week. It was up all night again this morning on it. Um, what Hamas did was a terrorist act and nobody can condone it, period. But we're, and one of the things I have done uh, the state legislators have been there with me. We've met with members of the Jewish uh, community. We have met with members of the Muslim and Arab American community. Quite frankly, there are safety, security concerns when you're talking to them are like word for word the same. They're scared. They're really terrified. Uh, and Jerry Clayton and I, uh, Kathy's here, uh, as we have done in the past when some other issues have happened, Derek Jackson uh, pulled together all of the law enforcement agencies, including the University of Michigan campus and the Eastern uh, University campus. And quite frankly, in some ways, it's our campuses that are really seeing a lot of what's happening and have put together a very strong statement about protecting everybody and that we will not stand for hate and evil and uh we probably should just share that statement. I'll give it to Teresa for it to be sent out. And that was distributed uh, yesterday. This week, um, the, it, it, this has been a really hard week. This week, they Marjorie Taylor Greene tried to censor Rashida. Uh, and I do believe in freedom of speech. And there are a lot of complicated issues. Now, I'm gonna, I am gonna—I wanna say this to you all. This week, this past week, we have a new crisis today. Um, uh, but 23 Republicans joined every Democrat to oppose that. And Tim Wahlberg, I know we've had many a moment in this room of taking his name in something. Tim Wahlberg, held as strong as any person I've said. Marjorie Taylor Greene went after him with a viciousness. I mean, you know how horrific she is. And he said, I may not agree with her, but I, she has a right to freedom of speech. And he, John Molinar, and uh, the, I've never even thought this would happen, but in Bill Hazinga, uh, all voted to table the motion. So, and there were a lot of other I mean, I'm not going to lie to you, I believe, and I did not want to see her standing in the well, censored in the House of Representatives and the message that that would say to um, many Arab countries. Now, I think there'll be another motion to censor her next week. 
uh, been working it all night to keep that from happening. And I guess one of the things that I want to, I called for a humanitarian ceasefire at the beginning of last week. I think people really need, and look, I've been, we've all had meetings and then I have been meeting and meeting and meeting with people. I mean, these kids are scared to death. I don't care if you're a Jewish student who's walked down the street and had people yell death to Jews. They've been called out by name in their classrooms. Women are afraid to walk on campus in a huge job. Can't even talk to jobs or go to the grocery store. I mean, people are really fearful for their lives. And I want people that both sides are fearful for their lives. And when you think about what is happening in Gaza, you have 2 million people that don't have water. They don't have electricity. They don't have medicine. Has anyone seen video of a child having surgery and screaming because there's no pain medication? Have you seen the faces? And people have challenged me on both. I don't want to see any baby die. I don't want to see a Jewish baby die. I don't want to see a Palestinian baby die. I don't want to see any baby die because of their faith, their religion, their color of their skin. There are children and they're all our children, period. I said to some of the kids last weekend, people are saying to me, well, Hamas is headquartered under the hospital. And what, what, how, if we're going to, and I said, so you're going to bomb the hospital so you can justify the killing of patients and the destruction because Hamas is under, I don't. And the kid said to me last night, last weekend on campus, well, what's the answer? I don't have the answer. These are really tough conversations that by the way, none of us have had to think about since, well, I, to me, some of us remember the Vietnam War. This is not the Vietnam War. The moral questions right now are some of the worst we've ever had to think about. And people are being pitted against each other. People are told, well, Hamas is saying they're warning people to move. Well, you tell 1.2 million people that they need to relocate. Where are they supposed to relocate to? The border hasn't been open. There's no place for them to go to. I mean, this is a very complicated place. But I do believe that Israel has the right to exist. I do not want death to Jews. And I don't think anybody wants anybody to die in this room. And this is the reality of where we are. And now I'm going to, we've got to start to realize that our words have meaning and that there are phrases that are used by people that are not intentionally meant, but are interpreted. Video last night uh, that is on Twitter has a phrase in there that, I'm not even going to say it, but is interpreted in those of the Jewish faith as death to Jews. We need to really be sensitive that our words have meaning that they're subject to interpretation. There are words that are used in the Palestinian community that people say, we don't have a right to exist, that you don't want us there, that Gaza shouldn't be there, that there shouldn't be. I'm for a two-state solution. And if anything comes out of this god-awful disaster, I hope that it means that we are really going to do something about the simmering problems in Gaza that led to where we are right now. We cannot ignore it anymore. That may be, I pray, I don't know what's going to happen. But all of us have to be very intentional right now that words have consequences more than they ever have. Be measured, be careful, and know that I don't want to see anybody die. I don't want to see harm come to anybody. I want peace in the Mideast, and we are not going to see it for a while. But even in our own words here in Washington County, we can contribute to the tension in the world. So that's, you can tell I've been up all night, uh, but I feel very strongly about it. So thank you, Teresa. Okay, so uh, words have meaning. Everybody grab a, a new button on the way out the door, take a handful, spread them around. We stand against hate. 
that's okay. Take what's there and we will have more next month. And we, you, we, you can write into info at Washington Dems and say, where can I get more buttons? We stand against hate. Thank you for Kathy for, you know, spearheading that and to Rayanne for shepherding it and to Lisa Murphy for designing the buttons. We stand against hate, all of us. Um, sure is hard to talk sometimes, isn't it? Um, you guys want to give us some good news from the county and then we'll move to the panel. I also, I also have a question. Great, great. Okay, uh, you want to go first? Yeah, Larry, come on. Yeah. Well, I, 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 and I, Larry just wants you to know that this is, read his, read his sweatshirt, and we both agree that there should be a big X through it. <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, the uh, In the world of elections, there's a lot going on right now. Is uh, Many of you are having an election on Tuesday. Uh, many of you are not. It's parts of the county. Uh, the, uh, the biggest set of elections are going on in the Manchester area. Manchester Village, Manchester Township, Manchester School District, all having elections on Tuesday. Manchester is voting on whether to become a city, the village of Manchester, and they're electing their city officials, mayor and city council, in the expectation that it's going to pass, that Manchester will be a city, and we will have 27 jurisdictions in Washtenaw County instead of 26. Um, and uh, in addition to that, you know, Manchester Township and, and the Manchester School District are having a bond issue millage elections. Uh, Chelsea and Celine and Milan are also having city elections uh, on Tuesday. And uh, uh, Lincoln Schools, Napoleon Schools, uh, and Sio Township are having millages. Uh, um, Sio Township uh, fire protection and um, the uh, schools are having bond issues. So that's all happening Tuesday. Now, the other thing that's going on is that we have the implementation of Prop 2, which uh, was passed in uh, 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 last November, and which the implications are still being worked out as far as all of the details uh, all the detailed implementation. And one of the big ones is early voting. The Constitution now with Prop 2 mandates nine days of early voting with every uh, statewide election. Now, Sio Township, as a, as a pilot project, has done is doing nine days of early voting before this November uh, election. Uh, and I uh, had the opportunity to vote in the uh, Sio Township early voting site uh, I, as a resident of Sio Township. Um, but the, uh, but looking toward, uh, this is coming up very quickly. February 27th is the presidential primary, uh, uh, the, uh, and then there's the general primary and the general election. And so there's three big elections in 24 and all of them will have early voting. And the, uh, the, the, the setup is understood to, to allow maximum flexibility for counties, cities, and townships to work out how early voting is going to be done. And what we're going to do in Washtenaw County, there are a few jurisdictions that are doing their own, City of Ann Arbor, Ipsy Township, uh, the City of Milan, and, and uh, Bridgewater Township. The other 22 jurisdictions, my office will run early voting for all of them. So if you're outside of City of Milan, Ipsy Township, Ann Arbor City, and, and Bridgewater Township, uh, then you're, you're going to be coming, if you want to vote early, it'll be a county-run site. We're gonna have five sites around the county. There'll be a site right here in this building, which will uh, be accessible to anyone who lives in anywhere in those 22 jurisdictions. So uh, if you if you want to, if you live in one of those areas, you wanna vote early, let's say you live in Pittsfield or something like that, you can come here to vote. Uh, the presidential primary uh, was scheduled for February 27th. Uh, the bill did not get immediate effect. And on the ordinary course of things, that meant the law would take effect after the primary. So uh, the legislature, as I understand it, I imagine our legislators could probably confirm this, is going to adjourn early so that that moves up the date of, effect, of, of, of take, things taking effect. And the uh, um, so that we will have a president, the expectation is we will have a presidential primary on February 27th. And so there is a whole lot that needs to be done to get ready for that presidential primary, including the Secretary of State comes, draws up lists of candidates, you know, all of the different things. We're going to need poll workers. In fact, poll workers, you know, we had 1,700 poll workers in November 22. We're going to need even more, okay, not just because it's a presidential election year, but because now we have nine days of early voting. And so as a poll worker, you could work on election day or you could work 
in the week, the nine days before election day, uh, you could work all of those days or some of those days, whatever. Uh, and so, and that would be a much more uh, relaxed schedule in terms of, you know, eight to five instead of, you know, 6 a.m. to midnight, you know, something like that, which, you know, but the, the election workers are not volunteers. They are paid and they're paid by the hour. They're paid for training. Uh, and uh, we always, we, I'm saying, we, the election administration community, all the cities and townships and county and so forth, we always need more election workers and we need, they have to be partisan. They have to be, every election worker has to identify as a Democrat or Republican or something because that's the, that's the, the election law assumes there's no such thing as an independent nonpartisan person. So that every, every sensitive uh, uh, task that's done is done by two election workers of different parties working together. Um, and one other thing, we have a, there's a bill in the legislature, and I hope that our, our reps are going to support it, which will fix a number of issues that we have with recounts. In Michigan, we have this absurd folkway that no other state has called the unrecountable precinct. That if a precinct fails to meet certain very rigid and arbitrary standards, you can't recount it. Okay, We once had a recount in Northfield Township where there were three, it was a very close township election. There were three precincts, and all three of them were unrecountable for different reasons. This is does not uh, 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 promote faith and, and confidence in our elections. We need to get rid of the unrecountable precinct uh, concept. And there is a bill in the Senate, the state Senate, to do that, sponsored by Senator Chang, and and I and the county clerks association and so forth are all supporting that. Uh, so. Uh, I, there's a lot more I could say, but I think my my colleagues on the county board here have more to say too. So here we go. Thanks, Larry. That's that's your county uh, that's your county clerk. I we have a question from chat okay. from Caroline Sanders. How many municipalities have refused assistance with the early voting process? Okay. Now the thing is that the, the municipalities within 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 Washington County. Uh, City of Ann Arbor has their own plan, and that, that's fine. And they and and the uh, 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 and City of Milan sits on the county line, and so combining Milan with any other jurisdictions would be extremely complicated because of the Monroe County portion of the of the of the city. Uh, the two jurisdictions that did originally agree to be part of it and then back out were Bridgewater Township and Ypsilanti Township, and I don't completely understand what they're because it is it is much less expensive for the township to have the county to basically go in with other townships and have the county uh, organize early voting than for the township to do it on their own. But if that's what they want to do, more power to them. Uh, the other thing that I should mention is that I am running for re-election in, in uh, 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 November of 24, and I ask your support. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Okay, you guys, you got about five minutes. Yeah, Max, and I'm apologies to Eli and the up uh, and the panel and Sydney. Oh, okay, we don't want to hold up the panel. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? All right, we have good news. Uh, so I'm going to tag team the good news with my colleagues here. We have uh, Caroline and Crystal on on the team here. I'm going to go ahead and talk about the specifics. So we passed about uh, a package of 2.5 million dollars or so to address the housing homelessness crisis. So if you came to the last meeting and saw the panel, uh, much of what was discussed there is funded by this. I know Caroline wanted to say something, so. Go ahead, you say something before I start saying what's all in the package. Um, good morning. Actually, no, I was uh, responding to the request to have someone talk about what's going on in the county. So I'll let you give the report. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to go through, uh, get ready to hear some numbers. So I'm going to go through the 2.5 million that we allocated here. Uh, the first, and this is the biggest chunk of it, and this is a it's a very unique program. There are very few places across the country doing anything like this. We allocated a million dollars to direct cash assistance for families that are experiencing homelessness and are waiting for a housing uh, support. Um, so we anticipate being able to roll this out and starting in the middle of December, and we'll support families for up to a year. Uh, we anticipate it'll be about uh, 175 families that will be able to provide uh, a lump sum payment and uh, monthly support. Um, for that one year period to try to help stabilize them in their financial situation. We allocated uh, $710,000 to eviction prevention and diversion efforts. Um, so these are families that are not awaiting housing assistance, uh, but have housing, but maybe they're short on rent. 
uh, and are at risk of eviction, we're going to be able to provide direct support to keep them in their home. Because uh, if we can avoid people getting into the housing and homelessness system, all the better for everyone involved. Uh, we, we allocated $250,000 to support uh, winter sheltering. Um, so you heard a lot about that at the last panel last month. And if you didn't, you can watch the recording. It was pretty good. Um, so we're, they requested $250,000. So we found $250,000 to add to the, the pot there. We allocated $150,000 to short-term emergency hotel stays. So if you remember last winter, the county ended up housing uh, a lot of families in hotels. Uh, and you know about that. Uh, you, did, you did great work. You did, yeah, you did great work making, making that happen. Uh, but that's not a sustainable strategy, and it's not the best thing for anyone involved, but it's still uh, a resource that we have. And we're going to do it to some extent, but we're hoping that these other things uh, mitigate that and reduce our reliance on having to do hotel, hotel stays. Uh, we allocated $70,000 to support unbanked and underbanked uh, families that are uh, working with our financial empowerment center. We're, that's a, a program that we have to try to help people provide free financial counseling. I'll, I'll get you in a minute. Uh, free financial counseling uh, and to support people getting access to traditional banking services so they're not falling victim to predatory lending agencies. And we, uh, oh, $250,000 to rapid rehousing. So that was one that we did during the meeting. It ended up being an amendment there. Uh, that was the one, what? Maybe five. Maybe five. Maybe 500000 is what Annie is saying. Uh, so that's that's all the things there. We're also going to establish a housing commission work group. So we talked about that during the panel as well. Should we have a, a county housing commission? Is there a benefit to doing that? What are some of the risks? So we're going to explore that. And hopefully we'll, we will have the results uh, and recommendations on that no later than September of next year. But it will be before then by, by the time we have it. And that's $2.5 million. Yay. And Andy wants to say some things too. And then if I have any time left, I'll take questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, since we're at a county uh, Dem party meeting, I just want to highlight um, this is this week's effort was kind of a culmination of the community coming together. We worked with people who were currently experiencing homelessness, people who have in the past, people who work for some of our housing providers, and just folks on the ground who are really strong allies for people who have struggled with chronic homelessness. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to our county administrator, Greg Dill because he um, has a really tough job of making all nine of us happy. Um, and housing has been the top issue for all of us, at least since I walked into the board in January. Um, but I also just wanna take the time to say that um, this is the largest investment we've made this year, both with what we did this week and what we did earlier this year in housing and homelessness. Um, and so I just wanna point out that who you elect on the county board really does matter. Um, electing candidates that are pro-people, pro-housing, anti-poverty. Um, and there are there are people who don't believe in the work that we're doing. So I just wanna say it's important to keep lifting up people, whether it's at the local municipal level or at the county level that care about um, lifting people up out of poverty, but also really investing in housing and not just dollars. Like we need local zoning laws to change. We need municipalities to um, build more housing and, and create more density to help offset the, the housing burden that we're experiencing in Washington County. And I also wanna highlight, um, we're going through the budget process right now. Both Commissioner Hodge and I have um, submitted a budget request. My budget request is to increase our ongoing funding for housing and homelessness to $1 million a year. Justin put in a request to increase our Hawk staff. Um, if, if you're not familiar, I think we covered this on the panel. We took over the Hawk system in Washington County before I got on the board last October. We need to staff it up. So Justin's amendment to the budget is about 250,000 that would increase staff support. Um, mine is a million for ongoing funding. We're talking about maybe combining those efforts, um, but ideally we would get both. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping for. But I also realize that we need more staff to help do the work that we're allocating resources for. So I'll just, I'll end there. Um, and thank you for, yeah, thank you for supporting. I, I think you all support us, but the work is really important and we can't do it if we're not there. He's being a little shy and also saying that we know that there are people that are going to run against me, her, and Caroline specifically. So just a thing to keep in mind if you want us to stick around and continue doing this. I'll answer questions. Yep, so that's uh, part of it. I expect that at our next meeting, we're going to vote on some amendments that would probably, I think where we're going to end up landing is, this is a guess, a guess. I think we're going to end up landing on two positions right now. Uh, the request to fully fund the office is three, but 
we, there are many things, including the housing homelessness crisis, that we have to look to fund. So I think it'll be two, maybe it'll be the three, but there's also all these housing issues, particularly this uh, the the hawk staffing item that I've talked about. I talked about that last time during the panel, and, and Andy mentioned it here. Uh, we're gonna hawk is the the sort like if you are experiencing housing and homelessness, you call a number. That's what hawk is. Uh, housing access for the point of yeah. Uh, right now, it's largely staffed by from on the county end by temporary employees. Uh, I want us to be able to have staff that are permanent county employees. That and then when you call them, they'll be able to do the intake immediately, put them on a caseload, and then be able to move families quicker through the process. Uh, that'll be that, that'll make the system uh, much more efficient. Uh, but that's not where we're at right now. So I'm hopeful hopeful that we'll get that. Am I out of time? Yeah. No. <laughs> Darn. Okay. Any, any other questions? Yeah. I have no problem saying thank you, thank you, thank you again. Um, and I, if folks will notice, uh, a lot of the focus of what you did was directed at preventing mm -hmm. people from being homeless. Uh, even though we're, you know, we're putting this great bandage on, because we don't want people freezing to death. We don't want our families or our children dying, but um, we do. We have to do that because we don't have enough housing that people can actually afford enough low cost housing, and that's going to be part of the future focus. But again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this is a great investment in making sure all of our neighbors, our residents in Washtenaw County, are safe this winter. You know, several months ago, Kathy, you talked to me about we had to do something uh, big before winter came, and I said we deliver on it. Just, just say it. We deliver. Yeah. All right. Eli? Hello. Oh, Caroline, there am you I? Go. Are you unmuting yeah. me? You're okay. Unmuted now. Okay. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to add a piece to what um, Chair Hodge and uh, Commissioner Somerville were speaking about. Um, I submitted a request uh, that would fund additional support in the new office in the prosecutor's uh, department that would address. Uh, renter education and hopefully uh, pair and be in partnership with some of the prevention funding so that our tenants are better informed about what their rights are and what the processes are when they're having struggles with their rent and what landlords um, are able to legally do and how we can have them be held accountable. So hopefully all of that um, funding will be in, will be paired with each other so that we have um, a multiple effect. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Everybody, just like, I'm, I'm just, my heart is so full of gratitude for what all of our electeds are doing. And I just, it's just so, so important that we recognize our role in making this government. So yay, all of us, everybody. Um, okay, so and apologies, yes, thank you, Janet, everybody. We 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 have the government we deserve, and we have really made it happen. So yay! All right, our panel is coming up. I want to apologize to Sydney and and uh, Eli um, for going over a little bit. Um, I am super super happy to introduce a new volunteer for the program committee, Sydney Cook. Cook, yeah. Sydney Cook. <laughs> It doesn't look, it's not spelled it anything, look. yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to all of our speakers for, for being here, uh, spending their time and for all of their work that they're doing. I uh, also thank you to our panel. Uh, we are very excited to have all of our panelists here today. Uh, first up, we have uh, Alma Wheeler-Smith. Uh, she chaired the Washtenaw Equity Partnership and is a former legislator. Uh, we also have Joy Gaines, uh, who served as a public defender in the juvenile realm uh, for 15 years. Is that correct? Uh, we also have Tamala Bell, who is an Ann Arbor teacher and vice president of the Ann Arbor Education Association. 
Uh, do we have Nancy here? She had a family emergency. So she can't oh, I'm sorry. I hope everything's okay. Uh, all right. Well, thank you. I, we have Jennifer Lawrence, who I know personally from practicing with her in family law, who is a wonderful local attorney and a parent to a Washtenaw County student. Uh, and then we have Principal Che Carter, who is here uh, to share his views as well. Um, so thank you to all of our panelists for being here. Uh, we are going to give them an opportunity to share their views first. Uh, and then once they've had that opportunity, we will open it up to questions for you all and to our folks on Zoom. Um, so if I could, I would like to have uh, Alma give us an overview of what the Washtenaw Equity Partnerships process looked like, uh, and then an overview as to findings, and then anything else that you would like to add would be appreciated. I prepared a long and the short version, and I'm going to give you the short version so that you have time to get to the meat of the panel's work. Um, and I'm going to do this the hard way. <laughs> the pursuit of racial equity in Washtenaw County's criminal justice system took a major step forward in August of this year with a penetrating community plan um, from the Washtenaw Equity Partnership. That was work was made possible by a substantial grant from the Michigan Justice Fund. The wide ranging plan seeks to end racial disparities across all components of the county's juvenile and adult criminal legal systems and articulate substantial recommendations for positive change at a critical point in our community and society at large. Building on the August 2020 community-led work of the Citizens for Racial Equity in Washtenaw crew that brought data to the fore indicating patterns of racial disparities in the Washtenaw County criminal justice system, Washtenaw Equity Partnership joined forces with the Vera Institute of Justice National Leaders in Criminal Justice Research and Policy to help create today's multifactional plan. The development of this report relied on more than 110 diverse, committed community members, people with lived experience, knowledgeable, engaged neighbors, and community leaders, including trial court judges, prosecutors, a public defender, and a county commissioner who is still sitting here in the audience today. Thank you, Jason. Um, this report was deeply informed by our community and by national evidence-based policy. We have the groundwork needed for Washtenaw County to become a beacon for racial equity in the justice system. Underpinning the plan is the assertion that Washtenaw County can prioritize prevention over punishment achieve racial equity in the criminal justice system. It offers proven solutions in the area of youth diversion, mental health and addiction services, larger roles for non-police supports and interventions, and more robust community-centered support for re-entry after incarceration. The plan also calls for the creation of a public-facing criminal justice dashboard fed by meaningful data from all parts of the county's justice system, a commitment to transparency and informed actions. It's critically important because we elect most of our criminal justice leaders in the county and citizens need to have a basis on which to make those decisions. And right now we don't. Um, and it, we hope that the dashboard gives you an idea of whether the people you are elect are actually moving the policies forward that reflect your values and, and determinations in the county. In today's world, we cannot underestimate the power of accessible, integrated data about all parts of the criminal justice system. We need to move past anecdotes and actionable to, into actionable information about racial equity that identifies both our needs and our successes as a community. This report is the broad and deep foundation for change at a pivotal time. Its implementation is now led by the Washtenaw Equity Partnerships Bridge Team, individuals with the skills and expertise to identify the highest impact strategies and to propose a sustainable, accountable structure to ensure ongoing commitment from the community in the pursuit of these goals. Two members of the bridge team were here today. Uh, Felicia Brabeck is serving on the bridge team as is Justin Hodge. Um, 
it is, we develop five strategies. Um, and one of those strategies was youth development. And one of the critical issues we are going to talk about here today is opportunities for youth development that keep them out of the criminal justice system. So the website for the report is the all one word, washingtonequitypartnership.org. Um, if you have questions at the end and there's time, I'm happy to take them, but it's really important that you hear from our education representatives here today. And I'm going to turn this over to, to oh, no, do you please. want Joy Gaines? Oh, yes. Thank you. Joy, just... you've got one. Yes. <laughs> Good morning. It's working. So I'm Joy Gaines. As um, Miss Wheeler-Smith said, I am um, an attorney locally here. I served, I serve at the Washtenaw County Public Defender's Office, along with Perry Stonequest, um, we were the co-chairs of the committee that worked on this and principal was also a member of our community committee. I figured that I would share with you a little bit about our process and um, so that you have that as that background as we go forward. So in terms of the people who came together, we had other principals, um, we had some staff of in particular the Ipsy and Ann Arbor Public Schools Youth organizations such as Ozone House were represented as well as the um, Urban League, pardon me, um, um, as well as from Eastern Michigan University, Upward Bound. I don't know why I want to say Urban League. I'm probably, I haven't had any coffee. Um, <laughs> also, um, Celine Police Department was there for our law enforcement. Um, other youth programs like the Youth Justice Fund and the Michigan Center for Youth Justice were represented, as well as from the courts, um, the prosecutor's office, former, and myself, um, former public defenders who work directly in juvenile justice, and then myself also, who works more in child protection, as well as criminal, adult criminal. So we had a pretty broad spectrum. And as part of that process, we also did um, focus groups with parents and young adults who had been in the juvenile justice system. As we were looking at this, unlike the um, other group committees, our committee looked at everything. And so it was a really big task. So I think you'll find as you're going through through this that there are many more opportunities that are not listed specifically in our section of the report. We relied on the other committees where there was crossover, that that would be a place where some of the things would also happen. So for example, we talk about data. There is a committee that's only doing data. <laughs> so. It's not like it's less important as part of ours. It's just we couldn't we couldn't do everything. Another thing that came out as we were talking um, is that um, our our committee was name was youth schools and youth, but in particular, Perry, Perry and I have worked together a really long time on the child welfare side, and we and definitively the prosecutor's office, we're really clear that sometimes there's not a big difference. And it's a huge question. How did someone and how did one child end up in the child protective system and another child end up in the delinquency system? And we were all also very much aware that even without a child welfare case, a petition for removal, that child protective services is often involved in these matters. And we had the other side of it, which we weren't able to get into a lot, but we were also very much aware that as youth age out of the foster care system, in particular black youth, they are more likely to be, or more likely to not have finished high school, more likely to be homeless and more likely to be involved in the criminal justice system. So as you see that, that's a, that in itself was a huge, another piece. And we added it in there 
but we only focused on dual awards, youth who were, in terms of our recommendations, youth who were in both the child protection system, court system, as well as the um, delinquency system in terms of our recommendations. The other thing is there were two things that we always, always came back to. The first were our guiding principles from overall. So as we were looking at these issues and we were trying to formulate questions and answers, um, we always brought ourselves back to the guiding principles of equitable outcomes, evidence-based action, accountability, collaboration, innovation, and resources. But we also added another one because, and uh, Maisie, who is on our committee, is um, part of the University of Michigan's Department of Education. Um, she's a professor there. And she had us always ask ourselves, are we looking at the system or the child? Because there's always that temptation. We're like, okay, so, you know, if we do this, 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 we can fix this kid, right? But we really wanted to make sure we were taking a systems approach. So there may be individual things that would make a difference, but because of what we were doing, we were always looking at systems, okay? What is the equity here? What is happening to African-American children here? What is the system? Not just what's happening in an individual family or individual school. Um, so, and I said this a little bit at the beginning, but I just wanna reiterate that as um, some of our suggestions, if you look really closely, you can see in the different strategies how, that are um, part of the overall report, that they include youth strategies as well, not just our youth development one. And so um, just, just something to keep in mind. And the last point is, in terms of when we were looking at the issues, um, there was a lot, there was a lot of um, contention about various points. Not so much, I think, because there was a huge disagreement amongst us, there was a huge um, there was a huge concern about what would be palatable and possible, right? So, for example, I think most of us, not a hundred percent of us, but a good portion of us, did not thought that school suspension should be eliminated across the board. You will see that our recommendation is for elementary school and used. Um, carefully with middle and high school students. So, but because that's something that we all could agree on would be possible. So I want, I want that to stay in mind that there are things that are we recommended because we believe that they would be possible and good first steps. The other thing is there are things that we recommended because we also were aware that the system is how the system is now and there are ways that could be made better. For example, having smaller caseloads for probation officers, but we did not want, but we were also very much aware of the potential risk of there being a smaller caseload for a probation officer for, a ju for um, in the juvenile court, also winding up more tension that would wind up becoming more picky. For example, one of the typical um, orders for a young person who, um, their disposition orders, which would be like sentencing in the adult court, is that they have to obey the household rules and that they have to go to school. So we wanted to be sure that people, young people are not extended on probation and being monitored an excessive amount of time that would not be evidence-based to do because now somebody's watching every time they miss a class or they don't go. And if that's, so that is also another piece. So you'll see those kind of things in our recommendations as well. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation to be a part of this panel. It's uh, an honor and a privilege to be here. My name is Tamala Bell. I am a fourth grade teacher. Um, at Thurston Elementary, and I am also the Ann Arbor Education Association Vice President. I have held that uh, position for the last uh, five and a half years, and this is my 19th year uh, as a teacher in Ann Arbor Public Schools, 
Prior to that, um, I taught in Inkster uh, public schools before Inkster was no longer in existence and taken over by the state, but I was there for two years. Um, I feel that I have a unique perspective um, for this panel because uh, prior to becoming a teacher, I was in law enforcement and was a police officer with the Ann Arbor Police Department. So um, I feel that that gives me a unique view, um, both on the law enforcement side as well as my experience now, more than 20 years as an educator, and the way that um, it is, uh, I'm also, I should also say that I am one of the co-chairs for the Minority Affairs Committee in Ann Arbor Public Schools, and we are deeply committed to restorative justice practices, its impact on particularly on our black and brown students. The equity work that we are doing um, is deeply important. And I think that it is so important to look at the systemic issues around um, not only just suspension rates in elementary, middle school and high school, but looking at the issues that children face today. They are very, very different coming out of COVID, uh, particularly for our youth, has had a devastating effect, not only on their mental health, not just the mental health of the adults that educate them, but the mental health of our, our youth is something that um, we see more and more every day. And as we look at and examine those systemic issues, the issues that children face at home, because I believe that everything starts at home, that we need to um, dig deeper into what causes our youth. And we don't want them to have those interventions and those experiences with law enforcement in a way that will be detrimental to them for a lifetime. So I'm very honored to be a part of this panel and thank you so much for including me. That sure. one, that one. Morning. Um, I'm Jennifer Lawrence. I know a lot of people in this room. I'm uh, an attorney in Washtenaw County. I'm a family law attorney. Um, I am not here in a capacity as a lawyer today as much as I am as a parent. Um, I was uh, born and raised in Ann Arbor. I attended Mac Elementary School, Slauson Middle School, and I graduated from Pioneer High School. Um, both me and my husband uh, are Ann Arbor school graduates, and I have two children that are currently in the Ann Arbor Public Schools. Um, the reason that I was asked to come here today was to provide a perspective uh, as a parent of what uh, the I've you know the Washtenaw Equity Partnership report, and in regards specifically to um, discipline for students in school. And I believe the reason that I was asked was because uh, last year I had experienced uh, the side of, unfortunately, my son was a victim of physical assault uh, during school. Um, so uh, beginning in about 2022, my son, who was six years old at the time, um, began first grade and came home from school and was reporting that he was being physically hurt by another student. Um, at the time, I, I downplayed it, believing that he was a, a small child and that he was likely uh, making these reports because, you know, kids kids fight, right? So there's not a lot that I, I didn't put a lot of credence into it. Um, unfortunately, those reports culminated in my son then crying at night, uh, refusing to go to school, saying he was scared of going to school. And this is a, a child who had been through uh, a preschool program, had never had any interactions with other students in a negative way, um, was always very well liked by his peers. So I was a little confused as to why he was coming home saying that he was being physically hurt. Um, a few months into the school year, I found out that um, uh, he came home from school and sat down next to me. And I looked over at him and he had a large cut on the side of his face and a black eye. Um, and mind you, he was six years old at the time. I just want to reiterate that. Um, I questioned him as to what had happened because I, I did not pick him up from school that day. My mother-in-law did. And he said that he had been attacked. Um, he was hit in the face with a water bottle by another student, the same student that he had reported had hurt him repeatedly. 
um, and that there was uh, an incident involving another adult where the student had also attacked his uh, another adult and uh, caused physical injury to that adult. Um, my son was um, upset. Um, the concern that I had was that I was never notified um, by the school. Um, administration did not contact me. Um, and so I reached out to the school after hours uh, and said, I want to know what happened. And what precipitated after that was, um, unfortunately, me finding out that the incidents that my son had been reporting were actually happening the entire year. Um, so I became clearly upset as an adult. Um, I was upset that this had been happening in the school. I was upset that the student um, kind of was, uh, in my opinion, allowed to do this repeatedly to a six-year-old child who, you know, at that point, he's just developmentally starting his school program. Um, what really upset me, though, was that once I kind of dug in and, and found out what was going on, my initial thought was, okay, well, there was a physical assault at school. There's going to be some sort of pull the student out. There's going to be some sort of either restorative justice process. Uh, something's going to happen where there's going to be some involvement. Um, what I found out as a parent is that I'm not entitled to that information uh, because it involves another student. So I was given not a, a lot of information as to how this was going to be prevented in the future. Um, what then came to fruition after that was unfortunately a number of other parents came to me and said that this was not a new issue with this specific individual, that it was not specifically just this individual, that there was some other cohorts of other classrooms where this was happening as well. Um, in my situation, I can tell you that I know of at least four parents, one of which was also asked to be on this panel today, have pulled their children out of the school district because of the lack of transparency and also the lack of, of um, I guess, any sort of restoration of, of either restorative justice didn't work if it was done or if there was a suspension, it wasn't made clear to us that it ever occurred. Um, so it's it's upsetting to me because we, we not only lost students, we have parents who've now lost their ability to give their kids an education because of, of issues that involve um, students who have a pattern. Um, and this isn't something that was specifically just my son. Unfortunately, there was other children I found out who were also harmed by an individual. There was also um, a couple other individuals. So my concern, obviously, when I read the report, understandably, you know, using suspensions for children that are K through five, I think should be used extremely sparingly. Um, that being said, I also don't think it's fair to the to our teachers. I think in Washtenaw County, we want to have the best possible teachers. I think uh, we are a great community. I, I love this community. I was born and raised here, but I also think that the lack of of responsibility being taken by the families of the children who are causing physical injury or disruption or lockdowns in classrooms is concerning because the teachers are also being subjected to physical violence. The teachers are being hurt. They're being, um, you know, they're not allowed to restrain students and there's not a lot that they can do. Um, I was, having gone through this myself, I, I want to just express that um, I do understand that coming out of the COVID pandemic, uh, especially in my line of work, I deal with a lot of families with children with mental health issues, and I'm not downplaying that at all, that that is a serious issue. Um, my bigger concern would be that there is not um, uh, a lot of oversight as to how families can feel comfortable sending their children to school. And, you know, kind of my motto was, you know, every child has a right to go to school in a safe environment. Um, and every child should feel like they can go to school without being bullied or harassed or physically injured. But at what point does another student's right to attend school, uh, you know, does that right, does that, there's a privilege there, does that right end when they're infringing on other students' rights? And so I have a really hard time balancing those two perspectives and understanding how far should we let, you know, a, a student go in physically injuring students or teachers before, you um, the other students are, can take into consideration. So that is why I'm here today uh, as a parent perspective, and I appreciate being uh, permitted to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good. Where are we? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So first of all, um, 
Thank you. I appreciate hearing that narrative as an administrator sitting right next to you and one of our AAEA leaders. I want to thank um, Alma definitely because she held me accountable to um, stay with this, right? Um, my name is Che Carter, principal at Huron High School currently. A uh, little bit about me, born and raised in Ann Arbor here as well. Grew up on the north side of town, uh, Arrowwood Hills Cooperative, um, 325 housing complex, subsidized housing complex, formerly known as the Heights. I think I have to give you that context because I need you to understand where, where I'm situated in this conversation. So growing up um, in that subsidized housing um, area, we um, all of us went to Northside Elementary School. At the time, it was a predominantly African-American school before we uh, did some rezoning back in the 80s. And I have to tell you that because that is a marginalized community and people knew who we were before we knew who they were based on what we looked like. Um, people had already decided who we were based on what we looked like, based on where we were at. So it was SES and it was the color of our skin. When I went to middle school at Clegg Middle School, um, that was my first immersion into, you know, just this, the the other part of Ann Arbor. And uh, coming into that space, you often felt that you were seen before you were understood. Um, went on to Huron High School as a student and then later removed from Huron High School and sent to an alternative high school. Um, and at that point, people had pretty much counted me out. Graduated from Huron High School went to Washington Community College, worked in the district, worked for the city, worked for the U of M. Everything you can think of under the sun, put myself through school, custodian at the high school. Um, all of this because I wanted to figure out how I could do something different. Like, how could I make an impact? How can I make an impact and fix the things that happened to me as a young person and the things that I saw a lot of people that I grew up with going through? And the only way I could figure out how to do that was to get in the system to um, impact the system to make some change. So what drew me to this um, Washington Equity part, uh, Equity Partnership was, you know, we all decide at some point in our lives where um, we decide to do something. And people that do this kind of work, people that you see sitting here, and I'm sure people in this room, because you could be anywhere right now, are people who decided to do something. So you can either watch it or you can be part of it. And a lot of times we underestimate ourselves the, of our impact um, because no one reinforces your greatness as you as you grow up. So being in that environment, um, I'm finally in a position for people to have to listen to me, right? And that's what I learned as a teacher, first grade teacher at Bryant Elementary, Title I school. People listen to me a little bit as a teacher. Then I said, okay, they're not hearing me. So I had to level up and became an assistant principal at Forsyth Middle School. People still are not listening to me. Became a principal at Patton Gill Elementary. Then I went on to Clegg Middle School. Now I had an opportunity to impact this space at, that at once made me feel not on purpose. I don't think it was malicious at any in any way, but I just think based on how we're situated in this town, we're a town of many stories. And so I had an opportunity to have an impact on the population at Clegg Middle School. And then I had an opportunity to come to my former high school here on high school. Throughout that, um, I was a student who was heavily disciplined. Um, while I went through school, my mother had to do a lot of advocacy, um, single parent, three boys. She used the advocacy center. There was a lot of supports. And what Tamala and I talked a little bit about when we when I came in this morning is like all the giants in our community who served to make it possible for me to even be here today because they labored or they, they stood in the gap where our families couldn't stand in the gap for whatever reasons. Most single parent households, people are working all the time and, and you tend to take care of yourselves. And um I said, you know what? I, I can make a difference. And so every day I, I never forget my story. And I share just a little bit about it with you because I need you to understand that now I'm in a position to to be a to uh to be a hinge instead of a barrier. And so I sympathize with some of the experiences your child has because those are the same things we struggle with as administrators. Um and again, I'm I'm not one to like sit on committees and just want to talk and talk and talk. I like to be in the action. Like I, I get to the solution really quick. But I have to I went through this process and I'm just like, yeah, all these things are the words that we're trying to actualize. So I know there's a part of the population that needs to hear this verbose piece as to how we address this. But a lot of it is really plain and simple. It's transparency. It's transparency. It's communication. It's relational trust. And we had relational trust issues in our community before the pandemic. Pandemic just exacerbated what we already knew. And um, 
now I'm in a position that how do I help teachers? How do I help parents? How do I help kids all at the same time? So these there's these dilemmas all over the place. And I think this program and, and this report does a good job at, at identifying the things that we can do. So it, it serves as a starting point to have a conversation about what we can do. Particularly of interest to me in this report was um, the uh, Handle With Care initiative. And so I've really found that to be super helpful in us helping students who we don't know are struggling. If you haven't heard about the Handle With Care initiative, what it does is it alerts the schools and it's it's countywide. It's coordination between law enforcement, um, the schools. And what it does is it helps me know that when I see this alert, um, this kid may have had an adverse um situation at home it could be it could be the police made contact with them it could have been a domestic dispute we're not privy to know what happened but we've trained our team to know that if we get that handle with care alert we need to particularly give a little bit more focus to that student not necessarily press that student and ask that student what happened at your house last night because again without the relational trust uh, families are not going to share information about what happened and that student may still be going through it you know they still could be traumatized by what happened and that's not the right time it really is just about putting eyes around this kid, uh, a web of support, as we call it, to where the counselors, the, the teachers who serve that student, the, the folks who see the student in passing and all of your leadership are aware that this student may be exhibiting some types of behavior, whether it be with, uh, withdrawing, whether it be acting out, um, whether it be um, transferring that to another person. And over that time, we start having more and more conversations and that student starts to build relational trust like, wow, these people support me. Um, these people are here for me. So now they know they have people they can go to when when they're having a, a difficult time. So I'm going to stop right there. But um, so many things I'd like to say. But um, if I get a chance, I would love to respond to um, rights and responsibility. What's transparent about how we do discipline in Ann Arbor, what should happen, the way we deliver it and the way hopefully there's more continuity with that. So thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you to all of you for your initial comments. Uh, before we open it up to questions from the audience, I'd like to know if any of you would like to comment or uh, ask questions of your fellow panelists. I do. If, I do. I do want to say um, that in terms, just just to bring us back to um, our overall purpose, right? when we are looking at issues of equity, we're looking at how people are treated differently based on whatever. In this particular case, we were looking at race, specifically for African-American students in our county. Let me rephrase that, African-American young people in our county. So, you know, whenever a recommendation for anything, you know, specific, we're talking about discipline, but for anything happens, we always think about what is the worst thing that could happen. But what, but to not just look at what, when we're, when we're grappling with these issues, we're not just looking at that, we're also looking at what's the equitable thing that should happen. So for example, nationally, and if you look at our report here in Washtenaw County, Black girls are increasing in terms of their contact with the juvenile justice system. So, so what is that about? I don't know that I have all the answers on that, but if you're looking beginning at the school, you know, that school to prison pipeline, then we're looking at things such as suspensions because their hair is not in compliance, right? We're looking at suspensions because their clothing is not in compliance. And it may not be that their clothing is out in compliance. Their clothing on their body is not in compliance, or it looks a particular way on their body differently than a non-African American girl. And all of these perceptions at that stage build in terms of suspensions, who has an attitude, who doesn't behave appropriately in school, whose parents are uncooperative. I mean, the, so I, I just wanna, I wanna say that there are extreme things that happen, like happened with Jennifer, but that's that's not our issue. That's not, that's not the one we're trying to address. And that doesn't mean we ignore it. I'm just saying that, you know, you, you can't, 
what I've seen happen is that the equity issues get ignored so that the worst case scenario of, a bl- of whatever doesn't happen. And so we need to make sure that we keep all of this, the whole picture in the back of our mind, right? So that's all I had to address. No, I, I really appreciate that that comment. And I think that one of the things that um, that we are working on, and I, I can only speak to Ann Arbor Public Schools right now, is of digging deep into that equity work so that we can, you know, look at the issues, not only um, how they impact our students, but issues such as how um, white privilege impacts our students, how bias impacts our students. Um, I remember years ago when I was doing equity work for the district of having a a, a, a teacher, um, a, a white colleague that was complaining about um, a, a, an African-American student in her class. And she was saying, you know, the parents don't help her with homework. You know, every day she doesn't have her homework. The parents are not helping her. You know, why aren't the parents helping her? And I said to her, well, I'm, do you think that I'm a good parent? She's like, absolutely. You know, I was a teacher in the school, a fellow colleague. She knew my kids because they used to come to school. I said, but I was that parent because I wasn't present because I was working. I was a single parent working three jobs, trying to put food on the table and going to school. I didn't have time to help my daughter with homework do you think that I'm a bad parent because you're making a judgment? And again, it's that, 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 that bias that you have about what does it look like at home for students? It doesn't always look like you go home and there are warm cookies waiting for you when you arrive, right? (laughs) That's not what it always looks like for everybody. In fact, that's not what it looks like for most students. And so I think that as we um, in in Ann Arbor in particular, dig into that equity work, that lens, so that we are not dealing with that implicit bias that goes along with making those decisions of how clothing looks on one body type versus another, how making a judgment about if you're a good parent or not based on if you help with homework or if you come to parent-teacher conferences, or if you can volunteer on the PTO, I think those kinds of things will go a long way too, because I that resonates with me when you, when you say that particularly. It's good to pass it to Jay. Thank you. Thank you. So as a point of clarification, um, when we talk about discipline with students of color in school, particularly one of the safeguards that we have in place in the school system is we consider seven mitigating factors. And some of the work we talked about in the recommendations in this committee had to do with the inconsistency across the county where there's no universal norms around um, mitigating factors that we consider for suspension of a student. Let's make it clear. We do have to remove students from school. As I talked about before, the dilemma being student safety, staff safety, student safety, staff safety. We have to keep kids safe. And in this day and age now, um, those things are exacerbated greatly to where there's a lot of concern when people send their kids to school. Um, My own child attends the school that I serve, yet I know any given day, no matter how great the school is, 45 minutes away, we saw what happened. And we have to keep that at the forefront. So when we look at students and their needs, the behaviors that some kids exhibit who come from poverty or lower SES, tend to be those higher behaviors that warrant more extreme suspensions. That has more to do with class than it has to do with race because based on your um, social, let me clarify that so no one quotes me. Based on where you're from, the behaviors that our kids exhibit tend to be the most undesired behaviors in any organization. So whether it be physical violence, whether it be physical assault, those kind of behaviors warrant removals from school and usually a higher level of, of discipline because they disrupt the entire environment versus a student who is skipping or maybe a student who may be caught with a vape or something like that. Those are you learn real early in, in life. Our kids don't learn how to play the game as well. And so they tend to to get caught quicker. Right. Um, and so, yeah, overwhelmingly, our suspension data is going to look different. 
uh, in Ann Arbor, I would even say go one more one more step at here on high school, particularly we have a higher um, rate of in-district transfer students, school of choice students and students who are newcomers. And so the reason I share that is because there's a whole different association that is required to bring students in to be able to um, navigate that system. So if there are violations and things like that, um, we have to consider seven mitigating factors. One of them is the student's age, the student's previous disciplinary history, whether or not the student has a disability, um, the potential threat to others based on that action. And then where we consider if restorative practices was used, could be used, or would it be viable in that situation? And then um, could a letter, lesser intervention have served the purpose? So this idea of progressive discipline really serves our kids well, as well as transparency and doc documentation for students as they matriculate through the school system. So people think that when you document student behavior, it's a bad thing. It's actually a good thing if used and trained how to use it in the right way, because when Tamala sends her students to middle school and that student ends up in high school, we should be looking at that discipline history, not to judge the student, but to use it as a data indicator of interventions that were put in place. So we're not repeating the wheel every time the student begins their behavior in a subjective way. And so there's a lot of things in place if used the right way um, can help our students so we know what worked and what didn't work. So I just wanted to put that out there when I'm thinking about black and brown students. I get to be, I get to stop it because I've been on the other side of that where I was judged by my previous behavior and just pushed out. Didn't consider my brother had been shot. Didn't consider a cousin had just been killed. It was just Carter's acting out. He's got to go. And so now we know better. So I'm encouraging people to unlearn, relearn and ask what's next. Unlearn what we thought about before, relearn, but then keep an open mind to what we have to do next post pandemic, because what we're doing right now, we think may be the best um, way to look at discipline and students. Um, but we may find things out down the road that we need to change. So just don't be locked into what we've always done. Thank you. I think what you're going to hear is um, a, a difference in approach. Um, we talk about out of school suspensions. Um, and I guess from my perspective, I've always favored something called an in-school suspension because we're sending kids back to their environment when we send them to out of school suspension. So what they're getting is reinforced bad behaviors. Um, but if we do in-school suspensions where they have coaching, where they have behavior modifications, where there is dispute resolution at work, um, we have an opportunity to change that child's approach to the problem that he or she thinks she has with another student. I'm really, um, as a former board member aeons ago, I'm distressed to hear about the problems that you had. Um, and we do have to address the individual and, and that person's problems. But if we can approach it in a systemic way that helps your child and the child that caused the problem, then both kids have an opportunity for improvement. Um, and it, we, anybody? Oh. Uh, do, oh, do we have any? Uh, we lost the mic. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that. I one of the things that I want to be clear as a mother, as a parent, um, at the forefront of any comments that I've made publicly on this, wholeheartedly, I I feel for the children that are also on the other side. I really do. And having you know, I I've really said I don't even know how many times I've said it. Probably a hundred. I, I feel so bad for for the children who are are in on the other side of this as well because I know something else is going on. I know that there's identifying factors that there's something else going on and that it is really concerning and and by no means you know I I went to Mac school when Mac school is a very different school. Mac school in the North Side in the 80s was a whole different world. Um, I grew up on the West Side, which was not the West Side that it looks like now. And I had a very different experience, really. I really had a different experience growing up. Um, I went to a school that was um, a, a lot different, I think, than what it would look like now. And I think, uh, you know, Che would remember this as well, that it was it was a different world. But I, I also remember um, 
and I'm not trying to sound old school on this, but a lot of what's been going on would not have, would not have flown with my principles. I mean, that, you know, if there was a physical violence, I remember being at Slauson and watching fights occur between people. And, um, and, and, and by no means am I saying that, that I don't think, I think restorative practices work. I do think they work, but I think the the issue of suspension is as well with children is not so much just to punish the child, but it really, it, it needs to it need the family. It starts at home. So the family needs to step up. There needs to be some sort of, whether it's with the parents or a grandparent or a guardian has to work with the school to address the issues because it's not just from a perspective of safety for other kids, it's also a liability issue. I, I mean, it really is. I mean, I think that's part of what the schools are dealing with now is that there is a huge liability issue with having students that are exhibiting behaviors that potentially could be considered um, extreme and those behaviors becoming extreme to the point where the district is now liable for for ignoring those things. So um, I, I guess I, and I remember also going to Pioneer being dress coded and things like that. And I 100% remember the disparity between people that were different sizes or different colors. And I remember seeing that as a student and I, I do not think under any circumstances children or students should be suspended for things like dress code violations, or I really think that's absolutely ridiculous for a number of reasons. But um, but yes, I, I definitely agree with you, and I appreciate that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I appreciate the conversation around um, in-school suspensions versus out-of-school suspensions. I um, have been a teacher in Ann Arbor long enough uh, to remember uh, a former principal of mine that preferred in-school suspensions. Um, that was uh, probably about uh, 17 to 19 years ago when, you know, that principal um, did that. And she did say, I didn't want to suspend a student and they spend the day at home playing video games. And not fully understanding um, the consequences of what that behavior was. Um, I know that that now one of the things, for example, if we were to have in-school suspensions is that we have to have the personnel, we have to have the social workers, we have to have um, uh, the, the, the personnel that's available to have those restorative conversations with students. I know that at my school at Thurston Elementary, we have zero social workers because we just lost both of our social workers. Um, and it's a, one of those critical shortage areas in education right now where, you know, with behavior intervention specialists, we have a shortage of those. We have a shortage of our social workers in schools. So, um, and as a teacher, as a general education teacher, I am not trained in how to have that those restorative conversations with students. I was fortunate enough to be a part of one uh, at the uh, the tail end of this past school year with one of my students. Um, I had a student that was, um, and this was fourth grade, I had a student that was disruptive, a student that was throwing dust, that was throwing chairs, that we were evacuating the classroom because of the extreme behavior. And at the end of the year, our social worker um, said, let's try a restorative conversation. And I will say it was one of the most powerful conversations I've ever participated in as an educator um, with this student and a small group of students that were designated by our their classmates to represent their feelings. Um, and I don't, and for that particular student um, who had been suspended several times, um, out of school suspensions were not something that affected the student's behavior. Um, the restorative conversation was a powerful conversation for the student because he was able to hear how his actions impacted that his classmates, he was able to hear that they were fearful at times because of the unpredictability of the things that were happening. 
And he says, he's, and, and I remember him saying, so is everyone mad at me? And one of my other students, I'll never forget it. And I almost want to tear up. And he said, no, man, we're not mad at you. We were, we're worried about you. We said, what could be going on that you would feel so badly that you would want to hurt anybody? We don't think you did it on purpose, but what could be, is there, is there something going on? Right. And so to hear a 10 year old, right, say that to another 10 year old is it's very powerful to be a part of those conversations. But I just wanted to put out there that the limitations that we have on being able to do this because you have to do it right. You have to do it in a way that is going to make it powerful. Otherwise, if it falls flat, if it doesn't go the way it's supposed to, it's Right. And so, but that's one of the critical shortage areas that we have, not just in Ann Arbor, not just in Washtenaw County, in education period of those that are willing to do the work as social workers, as behavior intervention specialists, in order to be able to um, affect that change within students. Um, you know, I mentioned that I was in law enforcement and I, and I, and I, and I did it and I did it well. And I, and I kind of hated it. And I'll tell you why for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that, you know, as a police officer, you're trained to go on the scene, you deal with people 99% of the time in their very worst moment of their lives that's happening. And then you leave and you have no idea what happened, very often you'd see that person again because you had multiple interactions with the, you know, the same people over and over, but then you leave, right? And as a teacher, I like being able to have that effect and to be able to um, have that connection with my students, you know, for the 10 months that I have them as well as with their family. So when we talk about the systemic issues that are going on to be able to make those connections to families. I've had families that are homeless that were living in their cars. I had a parent once ask me, do you all have toilet paper at the school? Because we don't have any toilet paper at home. How can that student come in and work and focus and get around the business of education when there's no toilet paper at your house? when your water has been shut off, when your family was evicted, when your dad is in jail again, you know, those are the kinds of things when we talk about the systemic issues, all of that is trauma and, you know, trauma informed care for kids, trauma informed education is something that when we dig to the heart of it, I know we talk about housing, we talk about those things, how do we help kids with the trauma that they're bringing to school and inflicting on others? Not intentionally, not intentionally, some intentionally, let me take that back. Some intentionally, because, you know, when you are the victim of trauma, you sometimes pass that on to others. But as we look at that and we look at those critical shortage areas, we have to do it right. We have to get it right. So... Oh, oh no, I was going to say, I thought Mr. Carter had some more comments. So, uh, and then Mr. Carter, when you're done, we'll open it up to the audience. Absolutely. Thank you. So thinking about the seriousness of matters, it really does determine if restorative practices is the best approach. One of the things that I'm seeing now is that we've been doing restorative work probably about five years consistently. And being at the high school now, I'm starting to see students be more receptive to those conversations. They're familiar with it. When we initially started it, it was really hard to get students in that space to have a conversation. And so um, based on the seriousness of it, um, out of school suspension sometimes is the best route because students need that time away. They need that time away to prep. They need that time to process. Um, and within the school setting in the elementary in school suspensions, again, I've served in elementary, are, are pretty effective because you can spend a lot of time um, and have a lot of touch points with students. But when you get to the high school, you really are stigmatizing that student if that student is being escorted around to get a lunch with an adult and they're escorted back to a place. Um, I'm someone who did a lot of in-school suspensions and it really does bog down your system and your ability to manage the school. And at the end of the day, um, 
the goal is not to push kids out of school, but how do we support kids in the school, keep them safe, keep teachers safe and educate. Some students are not coming to school just to get an education. The education sometimes is socialization. And so when we have previous knowledge of what interventions have worked with students, we're able to put in support systems like social work, like uh, intervention specialists. We're a resource rich community in Ann Arbor and I don't want to shy away from our local partners because I'm very well aware of their different reality and situation. And so being having a lot of resources in Ann Arbor means we have more responsibility to demonstrate um, effective um, processes that we can put in place to help kids when we do have to put them out of school. When we when we put them out of school, when we bring them back, um, it's wraparound services from that point on. It's not suspension, go back in school. When I was removed from school, I never knew and there was never a conversation as to what I really did and when I came back, I didn't know why I came back. And so having these conversations and being partners with parents, even if it upsets them, being transparent about to the victim as well, really does make restorative practices work. It doesn't work if everyone's not informed about what the process entails, why it's the way it is, and what were the consequences, why, um, and then being transparent. And so even though your your child might be the victim, um, they understand that there was a response. And we use this, you use this phrase a lot in high school, at least it's, I can't guarantee things don't happen. I can guarantee you a response. And I can be transparent about what that response is based on the rights and responsibility. We want our kids to know that even if they're being removed from school, because the next step could be the system. And the system, once they leave high school, is not prepared to, to approach their needs in a social emotional way. It really is. There's a law. You broke the law. And then once you're in that system, you're gone. I've conducted funerals. Um, I've watched kids go to prison for life. I've watched kids go to Harvard. And, like, and throughout that, you you see this whole continuum in a high school. But having that elementary, middle and high school experience now, the same kids that were struggling in elementary are struggling in high school. Something doesn't uh, miraculously change when they get to high school. So hiding or not um, acknowledging what suspensions they have. If I see a kid that gets to high school and they've already had, you know, 20 suspensions, number one, what kind of interventions happen? We know suspension is not working for this kid. So now let's look at placement. Where can we place this student to be supported in the way they need to be supported? And in our county, there's not a lot of that. There's not a lot of alternative programming where we can um, elevate the social emotional supports for our kids. And it's not to push them out, but if you have a framework that really does get after um, social emotional needs of students, I think we'll have a better chance with that middle school to high school transition. So thank you. Uh, does anyone in our audience have questions? Okay, I will bring the mic. Thank you, you know, I always do. <laughs> um, I, this is a, a comment and a question in thinking of, of Jennifer's situation with the very young kids, because uh, Mr. Carter knows me from subbing in the Huron Music Program, but I've also subbed in just about every special ed classroom in the county <laughs> at some point, including uh, what used to be called for a school. I don't know what they're called now. And I'm just wondering if a kid, a very young kid, has that level of continuing ongoing violence what is going on that he's not being put in a situation like that, which is exactly those sort of social emotional supports with all of its faults? I mean, it's not wonderful, but it's still I would think that would be more appropriate. And of course, you can't say in, the, in an individual case, but is that system really working? Because I've also seen other anecdotal things about kids who really are not don't seem to be placed where they ought to be placed. A lot of times um, when students are that young, in my experience, um, something happened. So we're not looking at um, what's wrong with you. We're looking at what happened. You know, what happened? Trying to trying to get the narrative. Sometimes the families are in the situation. Sometimes they're not. But once you build that relational trust with the family and find out what happened, you put safety measures in place to keep that student safe, but also respecting their dignity by not exposing whatever personal things um, have come into play. So if you know you have a student who has a, a high rate of putting their hands on another kid, well, then you have to look at the classroom environment. How do you set up the classroom in a way to where this student has um, all behavior is is uh, is is a uh, language, 
right? They're expressing something that they don't yet know how to express to, to get their needs met. And so how do we set up that classroom environment in a way to get their needs met that doesn't require them to uh, have extension bursts to get the attention that they like to see? So it starts there. Number one is um, understanding the context for which that student is in school. They could be two parent household, it could be a single parent household. We can't label it as one way or the other. It can be anything, but you got to get that information, build that relational trust with the family that they'll trust ex- sharing information with you that won't put them, that won't allow them to be judged or their child to be stigmatized. Um, the other thing is working with the entire class, understanding that everyone's different. We all, we all are differently able. So creating a classroom environment where respect is for everyone because we've um we set that situation up to say there's a different perspective not a different perspective a lot of times in our society different means less um and it's usually geared toward the dominant culture um lifestyle and even me being middle class now i can perpetuate that as a principle because now i'm in this quote unquote social class i'm not really i'm i'm still paying the loans and i'm first first generation out but um i'm looked upon as part of the problem sometimes depending on how how that family has been socialized in the community. Sometimes, you know, people would think, oh, black man, this is great for a black child. But what if every black man in that child's life has not been a positive experience for them? So the, the skin doesn't get me uh, automatic votes. I have to go in and create the relationship, the trust from the leadership level. Then the teacher has to have that ability, um, that anti-bias training, the difference perspective to understand how to support that child and, it's, and it may not be contextual to what their experience is. So it really is multifaceted. It's not a one shot approach, but it starts there for me and a leadership. Yeah, I was going to say that we we definitely are seeing younger and younger kids um, that have um, extreme behaviors um, in schools. And I know, um, as as Che said, that that wraparound support. Um, sometimes students are special education students and sometimes they're not. Um, Particularly if you're a very young student, um, you won't necessarily be a special education student. Um, And, you know, I agree with you that um, students may not have the language to express how they're feeling. They will show you through their actions. And so as we look at, you know, what is going on with the child. And again, um, look at those services, those supports that we can put in place to help not only that child, but to, to help the family. And so you are working to um, build those relationships with the family to get them to trust you because families don't always, um, I was, I was, you know, it took an extraordinary amount of trust for uh, you know, the parent whose family didn't have toilet paper to come to school and ask me, did they have toilet paper, right? Do we have toilet paper? She didn't want to say we're living in our car because she was worried. Many, many families see us as a part of that government establishment. She was worried I was going to call Child Protective Services and that she would lose her children which sometimes you have to do. I've unfortunately had to call CPS. Um, But she was worried because her family was homeless. We were going to report them to child protective services, and then she would lose her children. And so rather than do that, what are the organizations within the County that can help families that are experiencing homelessness? Um, And, to establish that trust again so that they don't see you as just an additional layer of, of that. And Shay is absolutely right. Um, having black skin does not make you immune in the school system. It does not automatically buy you trust with families. See another question. Yep. Thank you. I may ramble a bit, but I want to kind of get back to what Joy was talking about, kind of the equity issues, like because a lot of times um, kids, especially, you know, African-American kids are victimized or or or, or accused of behavior, which is that um, um, and um, um, 
um, discipline for behavior to behavior that are behavior of children, right? And so I I I just kind of like years ago when I worked with Alma on I want to say over oh my gosh forty years ago on issues of just getting da- data from the school system on um, um, suspensions and um, and erase data on suspensions. And I don't know if if this, the Ann Arbor public schools weren't even reporting it, right? So I, I guess my question is, is that being reported? And I think um, Mr. Carter, you talked about kind of the, the, um, the um, uh, unconscious bias training that teachers are getting, right? And how has that improved those statistics if, if we have that data um, yet? And what are we doing? And Joy, I don't know if you could speak to how when you were um, working in um, the juvenile division, how kind of that, that um, um, you know, that focus on African-American kids led to them being part of a system early on and then trying to get them out is very difficult. I know I'm rambling a bit and there's a lot of questions there, but I just think um, I'm just identifying that kids get in trouble and then, you know, we have to help the kids. It's kind of, um, we also have to see the other side that maybe the system and the people in the system are creating um, just as just this many problems for the children. I wasn't I think I think we should point out that the person that just asked that question is our public defender for our county, <laughs> Delphia Simpson, who's the Washington County public defender. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know that I'm equipped to answer that question, but I think maybe it was pointed to Joy. Joy, would you like a microphone? Uh, okay. I feel like I'm in therapy right now because we're, we're talking about it, which is great. Um, and it's good that we can talk about it because, yes, systemically, the system does what it's designed to do, right? Um, the system is normalized based on a, a, a dominant culture perspective about power and control. Helping, at least once they get into high school, helping people understand systemic structures is part of it. That is part of it is educating um, our, our population as to how it works. As far as um, students, once they once they get into the system and bringing them back, that's something I am very passionate about. And I think right now our county does a good job of helping us, I, number one, identify when a student has entered the system. And then they, they're very communicative about when they come back out of the system. And so when we bring them back into the schools, we really have to do, we have to go through an intake process where we bring them in and, and help them matriculate back into the schools, working with the teachers to reduce assignments and workload. But uh, as far as the anti-bias training for teachers, it's a hit or miss. You can give the information, but they're not required to morally change. And the messages that we send out as leaders is we're the ones that have to change. Um, the power and control perspective of leadership is gone. It, it really starts about um, being transparent, uh, relational trust. As I lead with, with my personal story, I, I try to do that with family and kids. Unfortunately, what that does is, and this is why the anti-bias training doesn't, ne- it's not a, it doesn't necessarily solve the issue is sometimes I minimize because of my, my truth. People want to believe that I crawled from under a rock and I was polished and, it, you know, I've got compared to Barack Obama. I'm a principal. I've had people tell me, we're just we're just glad you're here. It's like having Barack Obama. I'm like, what? That that dude lived a flawless life and he's got compared to Che Carter. That's horrible. So anti-bias training only works as well as the person who wants to change. I'm not waiting for the adults to change. If there's a breach of equity, then we're going to talk and 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 I'm going to get you to your next level. But I'll give you a good example without putting names out there. I have an expectation that kids are not released to um go get a DoorDash because they ordered DoorDash and a teacher lets them leave. Well, the conversation I'm having with my student is that that person just lowered the expectation for you. They allowed you to leave, which means either what they're doing is not important or your learning is not important. So then my conversation with the adult is help me understand how this supports a learner. It's t- you, you can predict. You don't need data. You can predict which students are going to be suspended more. You can predict which students are going to underperform because the system, which I thought after the pandemic, we were going to break it up, like really shake up 
how we did public education, but we're not doing it differently. We just added some technology and more layers of things that make it difficult to navigate for for um our um our families who are still in struggle mode have never made it to that next tech level beyond beyond the phone. So now we made it more complicated for parents to even monitor how um how our kids are doing. So anti bias training is only as good as the people who want to receive it. And everybody wants a quick fix. They want one meeting. You tell me what I need to do. And if it didn't work, I'm done. The kid has to change. So as we bring in educators, like we're talking to the colleges and I'm like, let me at these prospective teachers. I need to talk to them because somebody's not telling them what they're walking into and, and we're losing teachers. I had a teacher we hired and they were gone by a Wednesday. They were hired on Monday. They just, the adults need support. The difference is now post pandemic, the adults need probably more support than the kids, because if you don't feed the teachers, they eat the kids. Ultimately, it's a book, this elementary school book, but feed the teachers or they eat the kids. And it's the same thing. We have to take care of the people taking care of the kids. But the training is like building a ship while it's floating. Right. We're we're preparing. We're doing things and we don't even know what the impact of our decisions. There's a quote that says um, there are years when um, there are, we go years without decades. We go decades without anything happening. And now we're going weeks when decades are happening. That's how rapid change is right now. And so preparing the teachers to be what they need to be for the kids, we really do have to show some grace because it's a person by person. By the time they get to you, um, that's not the first time that something's happened. It's just been a series of events that they just couldn't get back on the trails. But once they come back into schools, sometimes those students are more ready to uh, engage in learning than anyone because they had it taken away from them. So it is very dynamic. It, it is not a one shot solution. And those are my thoughts to that. Uh, hold on to your mic, Mr. Carter. I, I have a question from the chat for you from Caroline Nathan. I'm on TV. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the question says, uh, you mentioned that students uh, who are struggling in elementary school will be struggling in high school. Do you have suggestions about the types of changes that might help at the earliest stages of schooling, uh, specifically in elementary school, that could prevent this cycle of challenges? Uh, and then any specific ideas that you might have would be appreciated. Thank you. And just to clarify, that's not all kids. That is some kids. And in, in my personal experience, what I've seen, because Fortunately, I'm at the high school where I've sent kids to from middle school. And when I look back at their previous histories um, and things, they were struggling because I'm looking at test scores. I'm looking at uh, achievement data, not just behavior data, but mostly achievement data is what I'm looking at. And they're still once they get into high school, they're still struggling. The problem is once they get there, they don't feel like they can do it anymore. So kids need wins early on. The school to prison pipeline starts in third grade. And from that point, you can look at the data and almost predict um, a student's academic outcome. It's not for all students. It's just for a lot of students that I've seen. My recommendations is we 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 have to we have to be more um, consistent between our transitions. I think those transitions are really important from elementary to middle school. So, for example, at the middle school, when students come from elementary and they were struggling over time, and we want to put interventions in place that might support that student to be a stronger learner in that environment. A lot of times, families. Um, reject their child losing a particular elective to have some type of support class academically because they want their child to have a fresh start. Um, some teachers' philosophies are like, well, they deserve a fresh start now. We're in middle school. But if they were a struggling reader in third and fourth grade and now they're entering high uh, middle school and they're expected to um, comprehend at a certain level and they're not prepared to do it and they go into um, typical with their typical peers without getting the support because they don't want to look different than their peers, then they're going to continue to struggle. They're going to mask that by acting out in different ways. And so the behavior is because I'm not engaged. Sometimes it's because I'm not engaged. I can't do it. I don't want to look less. So let me take some power and control. So by the time they get into high school, if you're still having that, the, the, missing those same opportunities for intervention, middle school grades disappear after um, that time. But once you get into high school, now, now you're toying with what happens in academia, which is Everything you do at that point is going to determine if you're going to graduate and if you're going to have a plan after college. So early intervention for me is really about um, providing the necessary uh, support systems during that time. Please. So one thing that I want to add to that, and I appreciate that question as well, um, and I'm just going to say it, I don't think we intervene soon enough. 
when I talk about the student that I had in fourth grade, this was a student that was on the radar in preschool. This was a student that was on the radar in kindergarten. This is a student that was on the radar in first grade and second grade and third grade. It should not take that many years until the end of fourth grade to finally be able to intervene and to put those supports in place, those those real supports in place that are going to affect change. The student is now having um, some limited success in fifth grade. Imagine if we had not waited until the end of fourth grade for those supports and interventions. So I would also offer that for students that are struggling in elementary, we are not intervening soon enough. We are waiting years and years and years to collect data, collect more data, get more data. You haven't done enough data. Have you tried this? And then let's collect the data. But we knew that when this student was struggling years and years ago. So that's what I would also offer. Uh, I see a question from Kathy and then uh, one additional question after before we close. Um, so what he said and what she said, the reality is that um, all the, st the, the really good transformational work that we are doing in Washington County around criminal legal system reform, we have a great public defender, we have a great prosecutor, we have a great sheriff, we are all who are interested in this kind of reform and lots of community people. But the reality is it's not going to change unless we change our community and specifically our education system. If you, we can, it's band-aids, it really is. When we have, starting in fourth grade, all learning is reading based. If you are not reading on grade level by the end of third grade, you are going to get further and further behind. And that, that is true of the second graders and their, as you said, and their kids who feel frustrated and stupid and not connected act up. And it goes all the way from elementary to high school. I was one of the co-founders of the Grizzly Center at Ipsy Community High School, and we tracked data that first year after when we, you know, after the merger in 2013. And the kid right before exams, right before the end of the semester, the kids knew kids knew which ones were going <laughs> to whether they were flunking a class or not in high school. You could track the data, and behavior issues went shoom, right up there. Because kids feel bad about themselves. They feel disconnected from school. They feel disconnected from the system. So all the equity work we are doing and talking about and to sometimes just patting ourselves on the back so that we all feel good, it's not going to change unless we make sure all of our kids are reading. They have to be reading by the, by the end of third grade, if we are really going to change things. I'm a big believer in restorative practices and social, emotional, and conflict management, not just for teachers, not just for the adults, but you teach the kids that and you teach them early. You know, they talk, kids, little kids will talk about fairness and all this. They can understand the concepts. I've been, I tried it out <laughs> on some little kids and they get it. You know, you don't talk in the same exact language as you do an adult or a high school student. You adapt it. But the fundamental problem is that we are not going to fix our criminal legal system. We're just beating our head against the wall and putting on Band-Aids until we fix the education system. And we need to start really, really early. So I'm, I was really... Uh, pleased when somebody suggested us do the look at the equity report from the education from the school to prison pipeline aspect because it is and we can we've got got to change this or we're going to fail our kids and keep on failing our kids and we're all going to be frustrated and it's really really not going to change i saw um a slogan the other day 
about literacy and it said literacy, literacy equals black liberation and that that is so so true you cannot say black lives matter and not teach our kids to read i'll add to that if um anyone is interested we have a local nonprofit uh children's literacy network that has a great read with kids program uh, if anyone is inclined towards volunteering with that program, you can check out their website. Uh, they are local to Washtenaw County. They serve Title I schools uh, and certainly always looking for volunteers for Read with Kids as well as their family literacy uh, nights. Um, so definitely, if you have interest in that, they are focused on that early intervention so that, uh, you know, while students are learning to read before they switch to reading to learn, uh, that is an organization that does some great work uh, in making sure that kids have those supports. Um, and in addition to that, Cara, uh, Caroline Nathan, who spoke of just a few minutes ago, uh, helps to run the Ypsilanti uh, Family Learning Institute tutoring program, which is a remarkable success. And they are looking desperately for tutors. You've got Washtenaw Literacy for Adults. There's work out there. We have in Washington County, a Washington County Literacy Coalition that, that brings all that together. We need to support our literacy organizations. We need to be volunteering to tutor. That's how we cannot change. We cannot create uh, real racial justice and social justice without our kids reading and reading on grade level early. Uh, thanks, Kathy. Uh, go ahead, Joy, and then we will close from there. Okay. So um, one of the things that often came up in our conversations when we were when we would talk about diversion and, and maybe Pr Principal Carter might remember that what we called informal diversion, right, where a kid is having, so for example, I was a kid who struggled in school and the teacher called my mom and I would read with the teacher every Saturday or something for a period of time when I was in first grade. But that's a that's an informal, right? That's an informal assistance. Probably changed my life. Um, so going back to our report, where we really wanted to do though is to how we can make those things systemic. So they're not just, you know, you know, one teacher is spread, is that, that you know, cause there's always that one teacher that that, that same teacher went on, a friend of mine is a couple years younger. That's the teacher who figured out she needed glasses. I mean, there's always that one, but we don't, we want it to be systemic. So it's not just one teacher. It's not just, um, it's not just certain situations. And so, you know, all, all of the things that have been touched upon, upon here, and I, we made recommendations with regard to mental health, with regard to trauma, um, but a big, big thing, I think, is really how can we, what can we do systemically so that, so that we're supporting all of our kids academically, emotionally, as a, as a, as a rule, as, as opposed to as, man, that's the best teacher ever, or those parents don't give up, <laughs> or man, that kid's a miracle. What happened to them over the summer that now they're different, right? So I think that's all I had to say. Oh, yeah. Can I take 30 seconds? Absolutely. To say thank you to the legislators who are gone, um, but for Washington County delegation coming together to get an appropriation for the Ypsilanti Community School District. <laughs> They have been laboring for years after their merger under a debt that has stolen money from the kids' education. And the state was responsible. And I'm delighted it's finally almost been fixed. We have to wait to see what the governor does with the line item. Uh, as we wrap up, do any of the rest of you have any closing remarks? All right. <laughs> I'll, say five. I'll count it out. Go ahead, calm me down. Listen, I want to just say thank you to everyone, definitely for this committee. This work is enormous. Um, we're all disruptors or we wouldn't be doing this work. And I appreciate all of my uh, elected officials for what you do. And I appreciate all the things that um, the court systems that are trying to do and being mindful. But I, I can't close out without saying that 
there are tremendous people out here in the teaching profession that are doing things. They don't document. They don't say, look at me. They just get it done. And there's so many um, teachers that I will, if since I'm in a public forum, I'd like to thank because there are people standing in the gap for a lot of our kids. And um, we know we got work to do as a system. It's not going to change overnight. We're not going to recreate the system overnight. I, I hope at some point we break it and we we, we we rebuild it because that's the only way that we're going to do the things that we're doing. But while we're here, our, our disruptors, um, thank you and thank you for the opportunity. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much to our panel. Thank you all to coming out this morning. Really appreciate it. I have one more who'd like to just say something real quick. Oh, sure. Sorry, it'll be brief. Um, I just wanted to add earlier this year, thanks to the fact that we have a democratic trifecta, we made changes to the third grade reading law. But um, my boss isn't here, but Senator Irwin has been working for years on improving um, early screening for dyslexia. Um, in Michigan, we're really behind compared to other states on early intervention. So um, if you want to track that, um, we're really hopeful that in the spring we can get those bills moving. Senate Bill 567, 568, and then House Bill 5098. It's a package that would um, focus on early um, intervention, train teachers how to detect signs of dyslexia, and then the House Bill creates um, an advisory board of experts um, to work with our um, education partners. So really important, um, and it'll help improve the, the issues that we see after third grade with, um, with students. All right. Well, thank you to everyone again. I really appreciate it. So I just want to let the audience and especially the panelists know that among the on uh, Zoom viewers at this meeting was Ernesto Corrijero from the Ann Arbor um, Board of Education, and he asked if he could share the video of this meeting with all the other board members. So it, it we, we do put the videos online, and sharing them afterwards often attracts a larger audience than the meeting itself. Just want to let you know. Thank you. Thank you. One last thank you. Thank you to Eli Nathans, who's chair of the program committee, has done a great job, and Kathy Wyatt and Loretta Codrington and Sydney, a new volunteer. Thank you so much for stepping up. You did a fabulous job. Just great. And thank you, all of you, for sharing your time and expertise. It's been really meaningful. Thank you so much. You. Take good care. Bye, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us.